there well I had a request from somebody on my uh, comments to I don't know if you if you don't read the comments I think that you're missing half the fun on some of these grace channels where you hear a good grace message uh, that really brings you back to Jesus Christ and makes you appreciate him and you feel like your heart's full go check the comments because you'll see there's good fellowship uh, the teaching produces the fellowship um, likewise if you hear a message that's full of speculation about the Antichrist and Trump and what's going on in the world you will feel unsettled and you'll go look at the comments and you will see they are all over the map because he who does not gather with me scatters Jesus said and we are either producing not producing fellowship enjoying fellowship and inviting others into it or uh, fragmenting fellowship and repelling people from it and that should put us in fear and trembling if we have a channel you know there's a lot of topics I could cover just because they're interesting but they produce speculations rather than what Paul called God's economy which is in faith and the end of the command or the end of the charge he said is uh, sincere faith and love out of a pure heart and a good conscience I think I got those backwards but see the fellowship produces the right atmosphere in the heart um, and the fellowship is centered on the gospel the doctrine of Christ Christ's work in his death and resurrection and his coming of course is related to his resurrection and him taking possession of everything he inherited for us on behalf of his people uh, a lot of people like prophecy but they disconnect it from the person and work of Christ and it becomes a field of speculation which does not invite people into fellowship but actually dismantles fellowship <laughs> and produces all kinds of speculation and questions which are breeding grounds for false doctrine and fear so we have to be laser focused uh, I'm learning and I'm, I'm I say I'm learning because I'm realizing more and more how profound this is John said we write these things to you that you have may, may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son Jesus Christ and uh, he said we write these things that your joy may be full and then he started to describe what it is we write and he says this is the message we heard and he keeps referring to this message which is the gospel you can study everything in the Bible as long as you keep it focused on Christ and keep Christ in the center and he is in the center of everything but uh, we tend to miss it you know and we get up on these speculative trail rabbit trails and they damage fellowship they damage consciences they damage hearts they damage the atmosphere in the heart and you can tell by the comments on the wall they're just all over the map but a good healthy message where someone really hits the mark um, will produce uh, good fruit and the atmosphere will be full of fellowship it's really amazing so participate in the comments I didn't mean to go up on that tangent but it just I I guess that's just what I feel um but one guy said can you he, is, he asked a question a couple days ago and I've been thinking about it can you uh, do a simulated conversation or, or a simulated uh what the day of a legalist looks like versus what the day of someone who's enjoying Christ looks like. Like, if you woke up and you were a legalist, what would your thoughts and activities be versus what, when you wake up and you are, have entered the rest of God. And that is really, I've been thinking about it for a couple of days because it's like, can you do that? I remember being a legalist, but it is very difficult for me to relate. And I've been thinking about why. Uh, you know, that person is like, I just can't go back to it and refer to it and understand it. There was this oppression and anxiety that gripped me. And again, you know, if you know my channel at all, you know that I 
frequently spend time in Romans 8. I spent years in Romans 8. Uh, and I came to realize that condemnation is not just from a way of thinking. It's a spirit of bondage and fear that is programmed into the flesh from so many years of interacting with this world as if we are slaves and not heirs and orphans and not sons. And uh, it starts, it, the root of it is a fear of God in a bad way because we don't see the person and work of Christ and how secure that makes us. And so the atmosphere of our heart is charged with fear. And the best explanation that I, I did a, when I first did my channel, I did a series and I've got a playlist on it called Two Mountains, Four Views. And it contrasted the atmosphere of Sinai with the atmosphere of Zion. Uh, we've come to Zion in the New Testament, which is the heavenly New Jerusalem, versus Sinai, which was the mount where the law was given. And the atmospheres of those two mountains are compared and contrasted in 2 Corinthians 3, Galatians 4, Hebrews 12, and Romans 7 and 8. It is not a way of thinking. It is what have you come to and what is the atmosphere it produces. It's so much more profound. The legalist is so much more, his situation is so much more profound than just a way of thinking. Zion is in the good land and Sinai is in a howling wilderness. And Sinai was unapproachable, even though they all were gathered at the mount, you know. And they had to be prepared for three days. They had to sanctify themselves and abstain from, put away their idols and abstain from sexual relations. And they soberly approached that mount that they were not allowed to touch or they would die. <laughs> because God is a consuming fire. And God was on top of the mount in this um, terrible cloud with thunders and lightnings. And Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. And then God began to speak from the mountain. The people wanted to hear the voice of God. So he started giving out the Ten Commandments, speaking them one after another. And as he did, there was a trumpet. There was, first of all, the voice of God coming from the thick cloud of darkness with lightnings and thunders. And as he spoke, there was a trumpet and the trumpet got louder and louder and louder the whole time God was speaking the law. This trumpet blast. Because his voice is apparently as the sound of a trumpet. To those, it's thunder, it's trumpets, it's unbearable. It's uh, to those who have not been brought to Zion but are at Sinai. See, at Sinai, you're not reconciled. At Sinai, you are a slave. Uh, Sinai engenders children into bondage. The giving of the law, it's a ministry of condemnation and death. And it produces fear and quaking and shaking as it should. It's almost like a foretaste of what people will feel when they are at the great white throne judgment. At the end, when God is judging those who did not believe and preparing to throw them in the lake of fire, I don't think that there will be any other more terrifying moment in the universe than that moment, you know, where you are standing there alone before God as he issues a decree of judgment. And the law is a witness against you. It doesn't give life. It ministers death and condemnation, according to 2 Corinthians 3. And, um, puts people in a spirit of bondage and fear and what's called condemnation in Romans 8, which is death. It's death and weakness. You can't approach God. Okay? Uh, and as the voice of the Lord was going out from that mountain, people told them, begged for the voice to stop. Said they never wanted to hear that voice again. 
and asked Moses to be the intermediary. <laughs> Don't let us hear God again. And from then on, God began to hide himself in the tabernacle and come up with extremely sophisticated ways to buffer man from his presence. Not to protect God, but to protect man. And remember, with the tabernacle, the priests had to wear the special outfits and go through all these ceremonies just to be able to approach the little box where God's presence dwelled. And they still weren't allowed back there. You know, they would have died. Only the high priest, once a year with the blood. So everything is so sober. No wonder it's impossible to have a sense of humor. No wonder it's impossible to be light. No wonder it's impossible to walk uprightly and smile genuinely. And at the at, that is an atmosphere. So the question was, can you you know go through the light day in a life of what a legalist looks like and what his thoughts might be? Versus someone who's gotten set free from legalism. And it's like, it's deeper than that. They are at two, in two totally different atmospheres. They are at two different mountains. Again, the guy, the legalist, he may be saved. But this is talking about the atmosphere of your heart. See, when we get regenerated, our spirit is made alive. But the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. And the mind set on the flesh is death. And death has to do with this atmosphere of trying to stand in the flesh on your own merits before God, who is a consuming fire, yet not being reconciled to him and approaching him as a slave waiting for commands and absolutely terrified that if you get it wrong, you're dead. <laughs> uh, angels fear and quake in that presence, you know? Uh, when it, when it's, when it's that kind of judgment, that this is not a place we were designed to be at. He said, you know, show me your glory. He said, no one shall see my face and live. I'm going to have to hide you in the cleft of the rock and I'll pass by you and you'll see my hinder parts. Uh, he's talking to Moses and the, obviously the cleft of the rock is a picture of Christ and he hit him in there, and he went past him. But he said, you'll only see my hinder parts. You'll see the shadow I cast, but not the face. And that was the glory Moses saw, and what he gave was the law, which was a pattern based on that shadow. <laughs> Whereas in the New Testament, God shines the light of the knowledge of his glory in the face of Jesus Christ, and we have his face shining on us, and it's a smiling face. So God hid himself in a man. He, be, he tabernacled in flesh. The word became flesh and tabernacled among us. The glory of God was hid in a little man from Nazareth. Why? God became a partaker of flesh and blood so that we could relate to him. He finally had a way to interact with people and show his true nature. And Jesus is Zion. God's glory apart from Christ is Sinai, but God's glory in Christ produces Zion. And Zion in Hebrews 12 is a festal gathering, meaning it's a place of rejoicing. He says, you've come to Zion. He says, you've not come to Sinai. Now he's getting ready to talk about discipline, okay, in uh, Hebrews 12. And he contrasts these two mounts. Why? Because he wants you to understand that God's discipline is not the way you think it is. It is sometimes unpleasant, but it is not a fearful thing the way we think. And the reason we think that is because our heart is full of the atmosphere of Sinai. And the only way to Fill our heart with the atmosphere of Zion is to come forward boldly to the throne of grace and to recognize that we have come to a better situation. The city of the living God, to the saints, uh, the, the, the spirits of just men made perfect, a blood that speaks better than that of Abel, and the mediator of the covenants, Jesus Christ. And uh, the church of the firstborn, the people whose names are enrolled in heaven, fellow citizens with the saints, heirs of God, 
children of God, children of the living God in his city. You know, the city of the living God is a contrast to the howling wasteland of Sinai. At Sinai, there was nothing but you, your fear, and that mountain, and that voice, and that trumpet, and the cloud, and the thunder. I mean, gosh, can you imagine? Whereas at uh, Zion, it's a fellowship. It's a festal gathering of rejoicing. And it's a bustling city full of activity. And there's the blood that speaks better than that of Abel. See, during the time when Sinai was given, the blood of Abel was still speaking from the ground. The blood of Jesus had not been shed. The, it was, the blood was crying out for vengeance, you know. But now the blood of Jesus has been shed and it says, forgive them. It says, uh, peace on earth and goodwill towards man. It says, God was in Christ, not reconciling our trespasses against us. Reconciling the world to himself, not counting our trespasses against us. Uh, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation and made us ambassadors of the new city, Jerusalem. And our conversation is in heaven. And we are city citizens of the heavenly city. We are fellow citizens with the saints. And we've been transferred out of the authority of darkness and into the kingdom of the son of his love. And we've been qualified to enjoy God. And there's joy and peace there. There's joy and peace in the presence of God. This is a totally different atmosphere. And that atmosphere in Romans 8 is referred to as the spirit of sonship. The mind set on the spirit is life and peace, right? And he says, uh, you have, uh, for those who are led by the spirit of God, they are the children of God. For you've not received a spirit of bondage, bringing you back into fear. And again, that refers to Sinai and the law in Romans 7. But you've received a spirit of sonship in which you cry, Abba, Father, is my favorite verse in the Bible these days. Uh, the Spirit himself witnesses with our spirit that we are children of God and of children than heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Joint heirs with Christ. Co-heirs with the beloved Son. Sharing his inheritance as children. And we can boldly approach God. Okay? And this is is the leading of the spirit. A lot of people think leading of the spirit means he's going to tell me something to do and I'm going to go do it. And it doesn't even matter if I understand what he's doing. I'm a slave. He's my master. I'm waiting for his command. And when he gives it, I'm going to go do it. So I need to learn to be really sensitive, to be led by the spirit, to know those promptings because he may have me do something I don't even understand, you know? Go put this dish on that plate next to that cup because when that person sees it, they're going to get sick. I mean, who knows, you know? It leads to mystical weirdness. But it comes from a... It's, it's, that kind of leading is usually associated with ignorance and a spirit of fear. If I, if I don't do it, you know, if I can't hear the leading of the spirit and I don't do what he's saying, then I may miss out on this or that or whatever. It's always backed by... Uh, consequences, you know. Um, but the leading of the Spirit is not that. The leading of the Spirit in the New Testament is the leading into this atmosphere of Zion by the Spirit of Sonship. Because we are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying out of a Father. And uh, that corresponds with Hebrews where it says, I will declare thy name in the midst of the assembly talking about Jesus, the Son of God, coming and making known the Father's love to us. That's what he prayed in, he, in John 17, um, that he's going to keep, he kept us in his name. He's declaring the name of the Father to us and revealing him to us so that the love that the Father has for the Son may be in us. And 1 John describes that as the love of God casting out all fear in our hearts, and we're being perfected in the love of God and learning to dwell in the love of God. Romans 5 talks about it as the love of God has been shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit, which he's given to you. And Romans 8 says, we've not received a spirit of bondage unto fear. 
but a spirit of sonship in which we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself witnesses with our spirit that we are children of God. God's witnessing is in our spirit, and the atmosphere of his voice is love. The atmosphere is totally different. Uh, and it produces a glorious liberty of the children of God. Freedom to stand in God's presence and know that you're accepted. Even though you're still in this sinful flesh. God made a way through the propitiation so that you can stand with a treasure in an earthen vessel and not be consumed. His glory can be shining in you in the face of Jesus Christ. And you can know God and yet be a sinner. <laughs> And yet, be even though you're a sinner, when you sin, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, who is the propitiation for our sins. And we just confess and come near. We confess not only that we sin, but more importantly, who Christ is. And that brings us into the fellowship. He cleanses us and washes our feet so that our walk becomes a fellowship. The way to enjoy the fellowship is just to acknowledge what is true. Yes, I'm a sinner, but I'm a son of God. I'm a child of God. And what are you doing then? You're agreeing with what the Spirit bears witness to. You are agreeing with God's voice. You are agreeing with the atmosphere of Zion, which is produced by a voice. See, Sinai's atmosphere was produced by God speaking of the law, the ministry of the condemnation and death. The fear came because God spoke in that context. The voice of the trumpet, the cloud, you know, the smoke. The trembling, the earthquake, the lightning, the thunder, all that was related to God speaking outside of Christ, in a way, you know. Whereas, I mean, it wasn't outside of Christ, but it was manifested not in the person of the Son. Now in these last days, God has spoken to us in Son, in His Son. And in these last days, He is speaking to His children about His Son and the inheritance they have in him. And this, this speaking also produces an atmosphere, which is a rejoicing festal gathering. It is the fellowship of the Father and the Son, enlarged to include us. And it produces peace in our heart. And it drives out fear. And it drives out condemnation and weakness and death and everything where we were just shaking in our boots and didn't feel worthy it drives all that out and replaces it with Abba Father, an intimate address to a God who's brought us near by the blood of Jesus Christ. And we're in his bosom, and he's in us as the spirit of the Son. Uh, the, and that spirit is not just the spirit of Jesus Christ. He's the spirit of God. He's the spirit of Christ. He's God himself. He's Christ himself. He's the fullness of the Godhead uh, that dwelled in Christ bodily now in our spirit. And he's wanting to make his home in our heart. Now, your heart is your consciousness, your mind, your will, your emotions, your conscience. And that all needs to be dealt with through the renewing of the mind. We are, uh, we have the flesh and we can set our mind on the flesh, which is death. And if you continue to walk according to the flesh, you'll still be in that atmosphere of fear. Now, flesh is not just doing bad things. In Paul's language, flesh is self-confidence and trying to do good things. <laughs> and then bad things also come out. It's the totality of me trying to be me in front of God without reference to the work of Christ and the gospel. The gospel is God speaking in his son to affirm us and bring us into the atmosphere and into the fellowship and change the atmosphere of our heart from that of the legalist to that of the liberated child of God who has a heart full of thanksgiving and rejoicing. And I've done messages. I did a message last year said a thankful heart is good enough. If you have a heart full of thanksgiving and confidence before God, you can know that you're in the spirit and you're pleasing him. I mean, you're already pleasing to him because you're in Christ because you're accepted in the beloved, but your walk is pleasing to him. And, you know, we tend to think that doing spiritual things means a certain thing. I'm only doing spiritual things when I'm serving God. Why? You have a concept of a slave. My son is pleasing to me, for the most part. I mean, he's kind of, right? <laughs> but my son is pleasing because he's my son, no matter what he's doing. If he's playing with his Xbox, and he's doing City Skylines or Minecraft, and he's building something, 
That has absolutely no use to me, and yet I'm proud of him because I'm like, wow, he's smart. Look how what he's building, and look how content it makes him. God loves you. you <laughs> and your, believe it or not, there is something satisfied in the Father's heart about you just being happy and have joy and peace. And you'll win more people to Christ and be a better expression of Christ that way than thinking you need to do something spiritual to please God. And I'm not saying that he enjoys it when we're engaging in sin or being in the flesh, but that all has to do with the atmosphere of your heart. You can know that you're, uh, you, you're okay. You really can. And that is the difference between the inward conversation of a legalist and uh, someone who's standing in grace. And I, he wanted me to do an impression, but I don't know that I can because the it's based on these atmospheres that are so profoundly different. And we grow out of the atmosphere of Sinai and into the atmosphere of Zion by knowledge, by understanding what Christ did for us in a very specific way. We have to ground ourselves in the truth and keep renewing our mind until we have become more at home in the atmosphere of fellowship than in the atmosphere of fear. And it produces a profound change. I used to be so conscious all the time of my performance to the point where I had anxiety attacks every day because the, I wanted to please God so bad and I was so circumspect and especially in social situations I was so afraid of damaging the fellowship, damaging the saints. I was so careful about what I said and I still and it made me nervous. And that nervous made it so the nervousness made it so that what I said was absolute foolishness. There all your wisdom departs when you are full of fear. <laughs> Unless you are the kind of legalist that actually thinks you're doing really good. Those are the worst kind. The self-deceived where they read the law, but it's not the atmosphere of Sinai to them. They're like, oh, we can do that. You know, why? They're totally blind. They're totally self-deceived. The, the one who approaches the law with revelation is going to sense the atmosphere of Sinai in it, and it's going to produce fear. And, you know, it's grace that taught my heart to fear, but grace my fears relieved. That's God's leading, too. He wants to lead you through the wilderness and then past Sinai and then into the good land where Zion is. Um, some of us have to go through it like that. I don't, because the flesh is so self-confident. My flesh used to, see, I started out saved thinking that God chose me because I was so smart and useful and gifted. And he's going to do something big with me. You watch, okay? Because I had that kind of attitude, I was a, I was a, the wrong kind of legalist that put demands on everybody. I thought everybody was backslidden. You don't read the Bible all day. You actually have a job. You are sold out to mammon. <laughs> you have a family that you're trying to raise and you don't have time to read the Bible. You are the very definition of Laodicea. You know, that's how I was for the first several years of being saved. I read the Bible constantly, prayed constantly, went to every church meeting, prayed in tongues all day, thinking that I was building myself up to be something really mighty in God. Oh, Lord. Well, the way God countered that was to uh, let kind of, a, there's been a spirit that's followed me all my Christian life that has people having supernatural uh, insights into me that I'm like not saved or I'm a false teacher or I'm a false prophet. and They have dreams and bad feelings and circulate rumors. And, and so that started real early in my Christian life. And I'm talking about like two or three years. Three years in a mega church. And people started having all these dreams and the pastors thought I was trying to start a church in their church and all kinds of stuff. And I believed all the accusations. And I thought maybe I was a false prophet. Maybe I was this and that. Well, through that, God brought me on a journey to humble me. And I was full of the fear, thinking that I might be a false prophet, thinking I might not be a believer. 
Maybe I wasn't even saved. I mean, it got worse and worse. And this went on for 15 years. And it followed me from church to church to church. <laughs> uh, long story. I don't have time to get into it here. But eventually, I began to realize that I had taken up upon myself a demand that I couldn't meet. And I was standing at the foot of Sinai. And I think that this picture really drove home to me from John Bunyan. Uh, Grace abounded to chief of sinners was a book where he talked about his battle with the law. And he just, he described it in the terms of Sinai. So that's where I first got that, you know, but I see it real clearly in the scripture that I had been brought to a place of absolute fear and terror. Um, and then when I couldn't take it anymore, I just finally backslid after 15 years of that. But my every day of that was full of anxiety. My thoughts could not stop going to, uh, like, obsessive compulsively, I've been rejected of God. And then every activity I did, I would constantly introspect. I remember my wife wanted to go to a craft fair. We'd go to a craft fair. And after 15, 20 minutes, I thought, we are totally in the flesh. This is completely the world. We are, there's no Christ in this at all. And I thought I was going to not have enough oil to be a ten, one of the ten virgins, uh, the, the five wise virgins, and I'd find myself in outer darkness. So just going to the craft fair filled me with so much fear and anxiety, and then I would have a meltdown, and I'd, she'd have to go home with me. And usually she was in tears, and, and I was usually by that point exploding, and I was angry at God for 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 making it so hard and oh it's terrible and this went on for years it broke it destroyed my first marriage i've talked about this you know uh just the constant atmosphere of fear in your heart so it's hard to relate to it's hard to say well i could tell you what kind of thoughts those were it was a constant spirit of bondage and fear and oppression that you're a slave to it you can't get away from it and it's there constantly you get no rest night and day and you think well that means he's cursed he's not he's judged for God no that was me having a mindset on the flesh which wasn't a sinful mind I wasn't practicing sin oh no I was so circumspect to not sin to not watch movies to watch my p's and q's to pray constantly Lord keep me uh sanctify me Lord you know read spiritual books read the Bible everything I could do but I, my mind was on the flesh. It was based, it was at Sinai, trying to figure out how I could perform so that I could stand at that mountain and not be consumed. And then finally, it all just broke when my marriage fell apart and I got out of this cult that fell apart all at once. A job fell apart all at once. I ended up down at my mom's basement. This is like 11 years ago now. And I just completely backslid. I just gave up. I was like, I can't do this anymore. And I had a, a conference with a counselor. I told him, tell him all my anxiety attacks and fears. And I said, I'm just so burnt out. I can't do this anymore. And I didn't feel like I'd won anything. I was the loser. Now I just need to figure out how can I live knowing that I'm probably going to go to hell? Well, I'm going to try not to think about it anymore. <laughs> you know? But I told him, I, I'm, I'm just burnt out. I, I give up. He said, well, what would happen if you did give up? I said, what do you mean? He goes, you know, what if you just gave up, stopped trying so hard to please God and just stopped thinking about it? What do you think he would do? Because he wanted to know what I really believed. And so I found myself saying, well, I'd have to believe that as one of the sheep, he would leave the 99 and go get the one. And that day, believe it or not, I resolved to just let go. And I did. And I backslid terribly. Um... For years, another five or six years, I could, it's all I could do to pray, Lord have mercy on me every once in a while. <laughs> I was so weak. I was brought into weakness. I couldn't read my Bible. I couldn't pray. I had no spiritual appetite at all, and I had condemnation about it, but I tried not to think about it too much. That's basically how I was living. And, um, Remember, this is in sharp contrast to the guy who used to read the Bible eight hours a day, right? Well, I got married again, and then my wife was like, well, we need to find a church. I'm like, oh, God. But 
I felt like we, we, for my family, you know, so we started exploring churches again and I found myself getting in trouble again. And I, through the getting in trouble, people would just like accuse you of things and, and I would listen to the sermons and I'd realize there's no gospel in this. I have no hope listening to this. God started training me, teaching me through these experiences, the true simplicity, bringing me back to the simplicity that's in Christ, bringing me back to the message I heard in the beginning. Jesus died for my sins, and I'm a sinner. And it's not to him who works, or him who runs, or him who wills, but to God who has mercy. And God commended his own love to me, and that while I was yet a sinner, and without strength, Christ died for me. And I was coming to those scriptures in Romans especially, in the midst of, we were in a Calvinist Reformed church that was a cult and some others, in the midst of all kinds of accusation, and God started using me in those environments in small groups to speak in a new way that even surprised me because it was just full of mercy. I could not bear taking up a burden of any kind, and I knew it. I was completely defeated. And the one scripture he gave me through all that was uh, the bro broken reed he will not break, the bruised reed he will not break, and the smoking flax he will not quench. And I said, I'm a bruised reed. I am a, uh, uh, I am a broke smoking flax. And so I had these moments where I started getting glimpses of greats in Romans, and he started retraining my heart. But still, I had no strength, and I backslid even more. We got into this one church where uh, they wanted us to sign a membership thing. The place was harmless. We finally found a church that wasn't really a cult, it seemed like. I'm like, okay, I don't want to sign a membership agreement, but I'll cross my fingers and do it against my conscience. And the membership agreement said I, you know, uh, I resolved to tithe and do things which I didn't believe in anymore. I'm like, no, that puts me under the law. I cannot be under the law. I knew I couldn't be under the law, but I didn't know how to abide in grace. So it was a really terrible place because I didn't have the presence of God. I had no spiritual strength or appetite. And the only appetite I had would be generated from arguments in my mind against what the pastor was saying or the accusations that would come to me in these churches my wife kept bringing me to. Uh, people thought, you know, I spoke a totally different language. And if you got me talking about the Bible, people were like, what? You know, uh, that's a long story. But anyway, I guess this is kind of a testimony video. Um, I, uh, Signed this covenant against my conscience with my fingers crossed behind my back. Well, when I did that, I completely backslid. I mean, completely backslid. At that point, it was like my whole Christian life, everything I've suffered, everything I've been through means nothing. This is just a game. Uh, don't ever do something against your conscience knowingly uh, just to please men. It, 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 it actually turns off any trickle of grace that's left, it seems. That's what happened to me. So I didn't realize that I was actually doing quite well when we got there. But see, my standard was I used to read the Bible eight hours a day and pray constantly and preach the gospel all the time when I started. So for me to just be normal was unacceptable. And I was actually kind of healthy and normal. Uh, my heart didn't condemn me. I could say, thank you, Jesus. You know, believe it or not, that's normal. My heart, your heart does not condemn you. You have confidence before God. That's how I was when we got to that church because I'd done some battling in the Calvinist church we'd been in previous, uh, digging into Romans a lot for a couple of years, you know, um, but still feeling backslidden because I measured everything by how zealous I was at the beginning of my Christian life, which was my flesh. It was my religious flesh. Anyway, some of you can relate to that, I'm sure. So finally, I signed this covenant and just completely backslid. And I mean, I'm talking like marriage should have been over kind of backsliding. Uh, I was just done, you know. This is just a joke. Uh, but then God brought me back around. And what he showed me through all of this is that he's faithful. He cannot deny himself. He, put, he, he made me an heir. And he gave me an advocate and a high priest. Who intercedes for me and when I'm faithless he remains faithful he cannot deny himself and he's been installed in my being and no matter what I go through he's gonna keep working to bring me to an end of myself 
so that I will finally look only to his grace. And then he's going to relieve my fears. And that's what he did. After I backslid that time, I came to come to Jesus meeting with my wife and just everything. Uh, this is like oh, seven years ago. Uh, I was done. And I knew that I was not even worthy to be called a Christian, you know. Well, then, after that, my hope just became the gospel. I stopped going to churches and stopped even trying, you know. My wife finally understood, oh, you know, he can't go to these institutional churches. He gets in trouble every time, and he's not seeking to get in trouble. It just happens. So she finally understood. Um, but then, a couple years ago, two years ago, I got discouraged. I knew the Lord was coming. And I felt like my spiritual life was going nowhere. And uh, I just turned on the camera and preached the gospel to myself that one time I started this YouTube channel. And it's been a constant flow since. And all I've been doing is dumping out all the comforts that God gave me over the years to keep me going through all that. And he changed the atmosphere in my heart. And now I really am at a different mountain. I'm not at Sinai anymore. I can't even relate I can describe it, but I can't tell you what the thinking is. I can tell you the atmosphere in my heart is different. I don't have, I don't, I'm not struggling every day, waking up with condemnation, feeling like I can't even breathe unless I get some kind of drink of water from God because I feel so, my default state was to feel filthy. My default state was to feel like a leper. My default state was to feel far away from God and like I needed to go through some kind of rigmarole to get close to God. Now, my default state, for the most part, is I'm reconciled by, by the blood of Jesus Christ. I've been brought near by the blood. I've been reconciled in one body on the cross. I've been presented to God uh, in the body of Christ's flesh without spot. He's keeping me by the power of uh, God unto salvation, through faith unto the salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. I'm not going to let anyone steal my crown. I'm not going to let anyone tell me that I'm not worthy of my prize. I'm not qualified by my works. I've already tried that. I'm only qualified by the blood of Jesus Christ. And it's to him who works not, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly. His faith is counted to him as righteousness. And that's all I have. I'm not, I know better than to try to pick up any other burden because that'll bring me back to that terrible place at Sinai. And I never want to go there again. And as a result of just focusing on what's true in Christ and sharing it with others or sharing it with myself, doing whatever I can to just keep coming back to acknowledging what Christ has done, my atmosphere in my heart has changed. And I feel like I'm finally, you know, I wake up and I don't have a, I'm not, I don't have a concept of, Oh, I need to read my Bible. Oh, I need to pray. I need to, Lord, help me be spiritual this day. And nothing like that. I get up <laughs> and then I'll just start going about my day and my thoughts gravitate towards the Lord. And that, I know that is him in me. See, I used to think that was me pursuing and seeking God. No, that's my shepherd bringing me to himself. He's operating in me. Before you know it, I'm eventually turning on the phone and saying some things that encourage me. And everybody's like, oh, that's so encouraging. So I know uh, this is from the Lord. It's really, I'm just living my life here. I'm not trying to be spiritual. I'm not trying to bind my P's and Q's. I'm not trying anything. I'm not trying to do anything. I'm just being me. But my mind has been renewed through the truth to see that I can't, and through my experience, I know I can't do anything. I know there's nothing I could bring to the table that would ever solve the problem of my sins that in themselves would keep me from God. And, and I deserve to be at Sinai cowering in fear, but for some reason, by the blood of Jesus Christ, the father brought me into his family and set me in the heavens with him. But it just took a long time for my heart to acknowledge what the spirit bears witness to in the spirit of sonship, this new atmosphere. And that's what it really is. It's an atmosphere. And the leading of the Spirit is that. Those who are led of the Spirit of God are the children of God. For you have not received a spirit of bondage bringing you again into fear, but a spirit of sonship in which we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself witnesses with our spirit that we are children of God. That's what it is. He leads us through all these experiences to eventually exhaust us. 
of any hope in our flesh. And you can tell when somebody's going through that and they think it's not the work of God, but it is the work of God. I wish someone had told me, and no, this is actually God working in you. You are completely defeated all the time and you're losing all hope in yourself. And you think that's a terrible thing, but eventually you're going to see through the gospel that God is not disappointed with you or grieved or surprised. He brought you, he engineered that experience so that you would come to realize what he already determined. When he crucified Christ, he crucified you with Christ. And it wasn't because you were good and he wanted to fix you. It was because he was done with you because you were completely ruined. And yet he loved you and came up with a way to reconcile you to himself and recreate you in the death and resurrection of Christ and transfer you out of that old realm into the kingdom of the son of his love love and the only merit you will ever have is the blood of jesus christ and it is through faith in his blood that we learn to come near to come forward boldly to the throne of grace to receive grace and receive grace and receive grace and it's grace upon grace it's not grace in exchange for our efforts or grace in exchange for your good behavior it is grace upon grace grace draws you to him and grace keeps you in him, and grace showers you with blessings. You know, he while we were dead in our sins, children of wrath by nature, uh, dead, right? Walking according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air who operates in the sons of disobedience. It says, God in his great mercy made us alive together with Christ and seated us in the heavenlies, in him, with him. Right, So that in the ages to come, he might show forth the exceeding riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ. Why did God quicken me and make me alive together with Christ, revealing Christ to me and raise me up and seat me in the heavens with him when I was such a foul sinner? The only answer the Bible gives me is because he loved me and he wants to show forth the exceeding riches of his grace and kindness towards me. In the ages to come. And now he's brought me to Zion, which is the city of all those blessings. And he's given me the spirit as a foretaste, a pledge, guaranteeing that I'll enter into this inheritance. And this spirit is the spirit of the son, which declares father, declares the father so that his love can be in me. And this spirit works in my heart to lead me out of the atmosphere of slavery and into the spirit, uh, the sphere of sonship, where I know that every blessing is mine and God is for me. And if God is for me, who can be against me? And he's the one who justified me. I didn't choose to be here. He chose me, really. Uh, I mean, all I did was believe the gospel. That's, that's it. Finally came to rest in believing the gospel, which is <laughs> to him who works not, but believes on him that justifies the ungodly. That's me. I was weak. I was a sinner. I could do nothing. And God sent his son to die for me. And now all I can do is acknowledge that that's true. And yet that acknowledgement brings me into a new atmosphere that is full of strength and power from the Lord himself. Because it's no longer I, but Christ in me. It's a whole different atmosphere. It's an atmosphere of praise and victory and thanksgiving. So no, I can't really do a side by side. This is how a legalist thinks versus this is how a, uh, Grace person thinks, all I can tell you is that it is completely different atmospheres. Uh, and yet, if you're the Lord's, he will lead you out of Sinai and into Zion. <laughs> and how do you know if you're the Lord's? Because you believe the gospel. See, the one thing is, through all those experiences of backsliding, of being fear, of being a legalist, all the different things I went through, I believe the gospel. I could not deny, even though there were times I thought I wasn't saved because I was so bad. I could not deny what the Spirit bears witness to, which is that Christ is the propitiation for my sins. He's the only answer I have, ultimately. And uh, Christ died for my sins according to the Scriptures and rose from the dead according to the Scriptures. That was the Spirit ter testifying. you know. And I, for me, that again, that is so profound because I was an atheist all my life. Oh, well, up until I was 22. And to me, Christ was just a historical figure. 
that wasn't even real, probably. He was just a fable. And then, through the gospel, he became so real that I could never shake uh, the fact that he's risen, that he's alive, and that this means that my whole life uh, ha- is is forever impacted. I can't go back to a world that has no God. And uh, because that of that radical paradigm shift, I knew that even though I was suffering in many different ways because of what I am, there was nowhere else for me to go, you know. That's like Jesus, you know. He, everybody departed from him and his disciples said, well, where can we go? You have the words of eternal life. Finally, I did quit, but it wasn't because I wanted to get away from God. I just didn't know how to relate to him any, at all. And I was done. I knew that my legalistic efforts hadn't helped. They'd only made things worse. So I just waited on him. That guy counseled me and said, what happens if you quit? So I did, you know. And what I found out is that he really is the shepherd who goes and gets the sheep. And I'm not advising anyone to quit. If I knew what I know now, I would have said, I'm going to preach the gospel to myself and acknowledge everything that's good in me in Christ according to the scriptures and refuse to believe it otherwise until the atmosphere of my heart changes. But I didn't have the strength of the knowledge to do that at the time. And I knew that the patterns I was in weren't working. So did God. So he wanted me to, you know. I think that I had an exaggerated journey because he knew he was going to use me to share that journey with other people. You know, not everybody has to go through all that. Um, hopefully that was helpful. I, I enjoyed it. <laughs> All right, talk to you later.